Okay, so last week you learned about BRST formalism, which is the way to quantize gauge theories um, and which gives you a possibility to um, replace the classical gauge invariant Lagrangian by a physically equivalent Lagrangian, which is not gauge invariant, but which, however, has a gauge fixing and simultaneously a so-called Fatih Popov ghost term, such that the combination of all these terms has a new symmetry, BRST symmetry. And the motivation for that symmetry is that ultimately you can define equivalence classes on the space of quantum states, uh, which allows you to extract physical versus unphysical states. And today we want to go a little bit deeper in this direction and want to discuss physical versus unphysical degrees of freedom, physical versus unphysical uh, states. And in particular, the highlight of today's lecture will be the proof of unitarity of the physical S matrix, which is a hallmark of uh, the correctly quantized gauge theories. So as a motivation, let's uh, think again a little bit more broadly. Uh, the meaning of gauge invariance really is that physics is described by equivalence classes. That is already the case on the classical level where you can do a gauge transformation which changes the field but does not change the physics. Therefore, different uh, field configurations describe the same physics and so you have unphysical degrees of freedom and equivalence classes of configurations which are uh, physically meaningful. And in the quantum theory, it leads to the BRST formalism and the construction of a subspace um, of physical states and a definition of equivalence classes between those physical states. And so if you think about this, then of course this implies a lot of um, uh, questions. Um, first uh, question would be, why the hell do we need this complicated setup? And the basic physical reason, if you go back in time to your electrodynamics lecture, is uh, that you need this gauge invariance in order to have a description of physics which is at the same time local and Lorentz invariant. So the gauge potential AMU is a local field and you want it to transform in a Lorentz covariant way and the combination of the two means that you have a gauge redundancy in your description. You could get rid of the gauge redundancy by fixing the gauge and having a non-Lorentz covariant AMU field, for example, an axial gauge. Or you could replace AMU by an integral of the field strength tensor, because you know the physics uh, FB mu is a derivative of AMU, so you can replace AMU by an integral of the field strength tensor, but then you have non-local expression in your theory. But if you want locality at the same time as manifest Lorentz covariance, then you need this gauge redundancy and we uh, get all sorts of problems. And so what we want to discuss today is once again these typical problems uh, and their magical solutions, as I call them. We discussed already the same thing in the context of electrodynamics and so today we will repeat this and uh, ultimately we want to prove the unitarity of the physical S matrix. This is what is meant by the term unitarity. But before we can do all that, we uh, discuss in detail the construction of the BRST formalism on the level of quantum states. In other words, we uh, look at the Fox space of states created by our quantized theory and look at those equivalence classes in detail which follow from the BRST idea. So for this purpose, we go back to the free theory and uh, do canonical quantization of it. So last week you have already done path integral quantization which gives you directly the Feynman rules and the Feynman rules are manifestly Lorentz covariant so you can already calculate green functions. But uh, we now take a step back and go to the free theory and do canonical quantization in order to also have control over the Hilbert space in our quantum theory because that is obviously also a key concept 
in the discussion of quantum field theory. In order to define the free theory, we take our Lagrangian and only take the bilinear terms in the Lagrangian, neglecting all terms which are of higher power in the fields. And then our Young-Mills Lagrangian contains this field strength tensor Fa mu nu, Fa mu nu, then the gauge fixing term plus xi over 2 Ba Ba plus Ba d mu A A mu and then uh, plus d mu for the F Popov ghost C bar A d mu C A. This is the free theory and from this we want to extract the bilinear term. And so the field strength tensor contains higher, higher powers in the field. So from here we need to only take the bilinear part, whereas here everything already is bilinear. Okay, so what is the bilinear part here? Uh, this field strength tensor contains the QED part d mu a a nu minus d nu a a mu plus higher orders and here the higher orders are precisely neglected so all that remains is exactly the QED like part of the field strength tensor and here the B field um, can be eliminated by using its equations of motion then once we do that we obtain here the ordinary gauge fixing term and uh, um, let's just write down the result. So let us eliminate B and let us also specifically choose the gauge parameter Xi equal 1. Then we obtain the following minus 1 half D mu A nu A D mu A nu A plus d mu c bar a d mu c a. That's all. Okay. So the B field was eliminated. That gives us a gauge fixing term. The gauge fixing term combines with the field strength tensor term to this simple result and the ghost remains unchanged. Now what I wrote here and uh, the calculation that I skipped is totally identical to the case of QED. It's exactly the same calculation that we did already in the last semester where we did the quantization of a free photon field. And indeed you see the resulting Lagrangian here um, does not contain any non-abelian structure anymore. You have all the non-abelian gauge fields with a color index A but you just have a sum over A and uh, there is no interference between the different gauge fields. So you have here just a copy of so many QED free Lagrangians. Therefore, each, uh, for each A, the gauge field behaves in the free theory exactly identically to the free theory of the photon. And therefore, uh, there is nothing new compared to the last semester in the quantization of this Lagrangian. It is identical to what we discussed for the free massless vector field. And here we have a quantization of a scalar ghost field, which we didn't discuss, but actually we did discuss it in an exercise. And uh, so we can completely copy the results from that exercise sheet. So that was quantum field theory 1b exercise 8 number two, and uh, that was exactly the quantization of this Lagrangian, including the discussion of the BRST the, uh, formalism, and there is a model solution done by you, uh, which is online, and you can look at it. So what we want to do now is to look at the operators which result from the quantization of this, and this is uh, uh, the identical content to the exercise, so I will summarize here basically uh, the solution of the exercise. So let's do this. Let's start with the quantization of the free vector field, which is uh, identical to the quantization of the free photon field in the gauge with xi equal 1. So let's write down the results. 
results of the AMU quantization that was outside the exercise that was in section 2.6 of our lecture there. The result is that we get creation and annihilation operators a dagger of k and lambda. For each massless um, momentum k, we get a cr four creation operators with a different degrees of freedom, lambda equal one, two, three, and zero. And uh, the polarizations lambda equal one and two, they were physical and transverse. Whereas the polarizations three and zero, they are unphysical. These numbers correspond to particular choices of those epsilon mu polarization vectors, which we use to write down the operator of the photon field A mu. There was an alternative uh, version of the lambdas, namely lambda equal one, two, L, or S. And uh, this has advantages for the interpretation. It's a little bit more difficult to deal with this basis um, if you do the canonical quantization. But the interpretation is uh, very nice here. So L stands for the part in the photon field where the epsilon mu is proportional to a momentum. Let's call it k mu. So that is longitudinal. Uh, in the sense that it's four-dimensionally proportional to KMU, whereas the S is the only one where KMU times epsilon mu is non-zero. So this is the one that survives if you do uh, in position space D mu A mu, this contraction. That is a scalar object. It is Lorentz invariant, and so it behaves like a scalar field. And uh, this operation projects out just the creation operator with the S. So that stands for a scalar. OK, and then, but in the uh, lambda equal 1, 2, 3 basis, we have commutation relations A of k and lambda with a dagger of k prime and lambda prime is given by the following, minus g lambda lambda prime times the usual normalization factor 2 pi cube times 2k0 times a three-dimensional delta function of k minus k prime. And the point is here, the prefactor of the commutation relation, so this then equivalently gets translated into scalar products between one particle states. So the scalar product between one particle state has the same result. And so here you see positive and negative norm states. So the G0, 0 for lambda equals 0 has a negative prefactor. So the lambda equals 0 polarization has a negative norm state in the space of state states in the quantum theory. So we get here negative or in general indefinite norm. And uh, that is, of course, connected to the Lorentz covariance of our field operator. Because the Lorentz covariance clearly implies that the norm somehow has to contain the metric tensor because that is the Lorentz covariant object and the metric tensor is in, has indefinite norm and that translates into indefinite norm on our space of states. So that is the result of the quantization of the vector field and we have discussed it. Now let us discuss the quantization of the ghost field which was part of the exercise and which you can also find in the model solution, which is online. The point is that the ghosts must be anti-commuting in the classical Lagrangian. They are anti-commuting Grassmann-valued fields. 
in the quantum theory, when we do uh, commutation relations, we need to use anti-commutators instead of commutators, by definition. So these are anti-commuting scalar fields. And let us begin by discussing briefly that the Lagrangian should be Hermitian if you think of this as operators. If you want that the Lagrangian is Hermitian and at the same time these are anti-commuting, then it's not correct to say that both C and C bar are Hermitian, like for normal scalar fields, because if you do the Hermitian conjugate, the order is exchanged and in order to bring back the original order, you get a minus sign because of anti-commutating statistics. And so therefore, in order to have a Hermitian Lagrangian, you can assign the following. C is equal to C dagger, but C bar is equal to minus C bar dagger. So the anti-ghost is anti-Hermitian. And then the minus signs cancel, and the Lagrangian is Hermitian. So that is important if you want to do an ansatz of the quantum field operator in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Um, as in quantum field theory one, we need to make the field operator Hermitian or anti-Hermitian by writing down the appropriate uh, expression. So then we do canonical quantization with anti-commutators. -commut uh, and so we can start with the canonical momentum 2C bar, pi C bar which is defined as dl derivative with respect to c bar dot. What is the derivative of l with respect to c bar dot? Here is c bar dot times c dot. So the derivative is c dot. So that is the canonical momentum for c bar. And what is the canonical momentum for the ghost c? It is given by the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to C dot. However, if you do the derivative with respect to C dot, derivatives for us always act from the left. You first have to do the anti-commutator between the derivative operator and the C bar, which gives a minus. And then you get here minus C bar dot. So here there is an additional minus. And this comes from the anti-commuting statistics. Then you can write down the canonical commutation relations, which are as usual, uh, let's c of x times pi c of y anti-commutator, um, which is the same as c of x and minus c bar dot of y. This should be a three-dimensional delta function of x minus y, where the time arguments are assumed to be equal. And similarly for the anti-ghost, c bar of x pi c bar of y, which is the same as c bar of x times plus c dot of y is the same thing. And then you have all the expressions that you need in order to quantize the theory. You write down the usual ansatz. And here the ansatz would be for the ghost field operator. So as an operator expression, we do the ansatz C of x operator is equal to this usual integral over a Lorentz invariant integral measure dk tilde times a creation operator and annihilation operator a sub c of k times e to the minus i k, k x plus a c dagger of k times e to the plus i k x. And here I have manifestly implemented the hermeticity of our field operator by writing here a and the same a dagger and in between we have, we have a plus. Then this is manifestly Hermitian, and it's the most general ansatz, at, as we discussed in quantum field theory one, the most general ansatz, which is at the same time Hermitian and satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, which um, 
is obviously um, also a consequence of the quantization procedure. Okay, and uh, then we also need an ansatz for our anti-ghost field, C bar of X, which is anti-Hermitian. So DK tilde, A sub C bar of K, E to the minus IKX, and now we simply do minus A C bar dagger of K, E to the IKX. Okay. And now again, it's manifestly anti-Hermitian because of the minus. And so then we have introduced now creation and annihilation operators, AC and AC bar. And we have commutation or anti-commutation relations between C and C bar fields in position space. And as usual, they are equivalently translated into commutation relations between the AC and AC bar. And uh, without calculation, we can immediately write down the result. Um, we obtain the following, namely A sub C, uh, A C bar dagger is the same as A C bar comma A C dagger with arguments K and K prime as usual and the result must be 2 pi cube times 2 K zero times a three-dimensional delta function of k minus k prime. So the last right-hand side here is, of course, the same that we always had. But the small but important difference is that here we do get a commutation relation between A for some field and A C bar dagger for a different field. Whereas in the standard case of Q of T1 scalar field quantization, you would have one creation operator A, and you would have here the same A and the same A dagger. Or in the case of a complex scalar field, you would have two creation operators A and B, let's say, and then you would get here A with A dagger gives something, and B with B dagger also gives something. But here we get AC with AC bar dagger gives something, and uh, vice versa. And that is again something that signals indefinite metric or um, yeah, not positive definite metric. So this will give rise to indefinite norm in the space of quantum states resulting from uh, those creation operators. So indeed we uh, immediately obtain from here a Fox space, which is the space of free quantum states coming from the quantization of this free theory. And we can sketch the resulting Fox space just by writing down the one particle states at first. And the multi-particle states are obvious uh, by combining one particle states in the usual way. So we start with a vacuum. Uh, which is denoted as usual for a free theory with zero state, which is defined by A with all possible indices uh, gives zero. Okay, this A all, whatever you do, uh, the annihilation operators annihilate the vacuum. And then uh, what is important for us are the one particle states which are obtained by acting with any A dagger onto this vacuum. And then we obtain, first of all, four different one particle states from the vector field operator. Namely, we obtain, uh, let's say, K um, vector comma lambda states, which would be denoted like this which are defined by acting with A dagger of K and lambda onto the vacuum. Then for any chosen momentum K, there are now four linearly independent states in our um, one particle state, uh, one particle space for lambda equal C, uh, sorry, one, two, and three, zero, or one, two, SL, depending on how you want to do it. Then 
for C and C bar, we get two more states for uh, each uh, K again. There is one ghost state and one anti-ghost state. So let's uh, denote them like this, C comma K is obviously given by acting with a C dagger of K onto the vacuum and another state C bar comma K which is obtained uh, in the obvious way. So overall, our uh, subspace of one particle states has the following structure. Uh, you can have arbitrary values of massless for momenta k. And for each k, there are six linearly independent states, two transverse vector bosons, two unphysical vector bosons, ghost and anti-ghost. This is shorthand uh, formulated as, we say, six degrees of freedom. And the long winded uh, sentence is that for every value of k, which is a massless four momentum, there are six linearly independent states in our theory. So we have lambda equal one and two. Physical uh, vector field components, lambda equal three comma zero or LS are unphysical vector field degrees of freedom and C and C bar are ghost and anti-ghost states. Okay, and then in a similar way, you can of course create multi-particle states and uh, then you can have multi-particle states consisting of all combinations of those uh, six types of one particle states. And here now in this discussion, I completely neglected the color index of the gauge group, the small a. So in principle, uh, as I stressed in the beginning, our Lagrangian is simply a copy of many QED Lagrangians for uh, the different color indices a. So each color index behaves independently uh, as long as we do not have interactions. And so therefore we have just written down the results for one color index A. And so you could imagine that you could also say um, all these states here still carry a color index and uh, there are as many such states uh, as there are different, um, different uh, uh, vector fields in our theory. So I already stressed that the norm is not positive definite and uh, the proof has not yet really been given. So let us discuss the norm briefly. But uh, I stress again that we discussed the norms of the photon fields uh, already in the last semester. We discussed positive and negative norm states and we uh, discussed the gupta bleuler formalism in order to extract the physical versus unphysical states in our space of states. But let's repeat this briefly and add the ghosts into the discussion. So lambda equal L and S for 0, 3 and C and C bar, they all have indefinite norm. And let's look at this. So for the lambda equals zero and three, we already wrote it down. So uh, let's say lambda, uh, let's, let's um, do a shorthand notation where we do not write the momentum always. And then the scalar product of two such vector field states with different lambdas would be given by minus g lambda lambda prime times the usual factor involving two pi cube and so on. And so here we see the indefinite norm. And on the other hand, what happens for the ghosts? 
let's say, what you would normally think is the norm of a ghost state, the scalar product of a ghost state with itself, what do we get? We would uh, have here the vacuum and acting on it with a dagger of C, here A of C, then the vacuum again. But uh, the only non-vanishing anti-commutators between the uh, ghost uh, creation operators are the ones with C and C bar, whereas C and C, they anti-commute. And so therefore here we would simply get zero. So the scalar product of a ghost state with itself is zero, so it's a zero norm state. But the state itself is not zero, therefore we have a norm which is not a positive definite norm. And the same is, of course, true for the anti-ghost state. On the other hand, this shows that we get a non-zero result if we do this, namely scalar product of C bar and C. Uh, that can be written as the vacuum, and between the vacuum, just a C and a bar C dagger, which is exactly uh, the one on the top. And this gives a positive result, and it's the same as this one here with the opposite order, and the result here is the usual 2 pi cube times the rest of the prefactors. So that is positive, but uh, that doesn't help. The states have zero norm, and uh, a scalar product between two different states is a positive number. That means uh, the Hilbert space has indefinite norm because you can now easily construct linear combinations of states which would have negative norm. So uh, that is the signal of an indefinite norm space of states. And for example, you can discuss two particle states, which we will actually need later, two particle states. For example, let us look at a state with two ghosts, let's say C with momentum K1, and C bar with momentum K2, that state would be defined by acting with A sub C with momentum K1 dagger and then A sub C bar with argument K2 uh, dagger onto the vacuum. So it's a two particle state in our Fox space and uh, these operators here, they uh, anti-commute, so the order matters. The order gives uh, uh, matters in terms of minus signs. So the state here is defined with this order of the creation operators, and uh, then this fixes the absolute sign of the state. And now let us uh, calculate the norm of exactly this state as it is defined here, namely the scalar product, let's say k1 prime, C bar K2 prime with C K1, C bar K2. Where this state is defined as the adjoint state uh, co um, corresponding to this one. That means uh, if this is defined like that, that state here is the vacuum and then the opposite order of the A's. And then you can see that uh, in order to calculate this, you need to do commutational relations between these four A's and A daggers, which you have here between the vacuum. <laughs> and in order to get something non-zero, you need to flip the order of one of them. So you can write this, for example, as minus C K, uh, sorry, K bar K2 prime, C K1 prime, and then C K1 C bar K2. So that's the negative of it because I've flipped the order of two creation operators uh, and then this gives me a minus sign. And now if I look at the operator expression of this, then immediately next to each other there are the corresponding A's and A daggers and I can immediately use those anti-commutational relations. Each anti-commutational relation gives me a positive 2 pi cube factor so I get overall from the anti-commutation relations 2 pi to the 6th power times the usual other prefactors, but the minus sign remains. And that means that this two-particle state here is a negative norm state. It's a proper negative norm state. 
So here we have a minus times something which is positive definite. So this is a negative norm state. And this state will appear later in our explicit calculation because it is a state composed of two ghost anti-ghosts. Uh, and this is something that you could write down in a Feynman diagram where you do a scattering with Feynman diagrams and somehow at the end of your Feynman diagram you have two outgoing ghosts and anti-ghosts that can easily appear. And so then the operator expression for such Feynman diagrams would exactly involve such a negative norm state. Then finally, let us discuss the BRST setup. And again, I refer to the exercise that was quantum field theory 1B exercise 8.2, where you wrote a nice solution, which is online. And uh, so then, um, Matthias has given last week the lecture, and he has already alluded to this. We have now a BRS invariance of our Lagrangian. We didn't write it down today, but you wrote it down last time. So the Lagrangian we started with has a BRST invariance. It is a symmetry, a classical symmetry. The classical symmetry gives rise to a BR Noether theorem to a conserved quantity. First a conserved current, then a conserved charge. This conserved charge can be calculated on the classical level he did it in the solution of the exercise. The classical Noether charge is some expression containing pi's and field operators. So it's some combination of canonical momenta and uh, actual field operators. Then you can quantize the theory. You replace the classical pi's and the classical fields by their quantum operator equivalents. And in this way, you get an operator QB. which is some expression involving integrals of pi's, um, the photon field, and the ghost fields, and anti-ghost fields. Okay. That is the standard procedure of defining a Noether charge, a conserved operator in the quantum theory. And it is an automatic consequence of the entire setup that the commutation relations of this operator, which follows from the Noether theorem, are such that if you do a commutator of this with the original fields of the theory, you get the symmetry transformation of the fields on the classical level. This is an automatic consequence of the Heisenberg equations of motions of the field and the commutation relations. Okay. And uh, so therefore, now in this case, this operator has the property that it generates the BRST transformations of all the field operators, but on the operator level. And so that is also part of the exercise. So we really have done everything in the last semester. So you take any field operator of the theory, do the commutator with this QB, and you get I times the BRS transformation of that field times this uh, anti-commuting BRST uh, transformation parameter theta. So, and this is the operator that uh, Matthias was talking about last week. So it exists now in our theory. We have basically explicitly constructed it. It has well-defined and known properties. And so let us now explore the properties in detail. So this QB commutator with the um, vector field A mu gives something, uh, and today I only uh, ignore prefactors because the prefactors are today not important for this purpose. So the BRS transformation is proportional to the derivative of the Fadeev popov ghost field. And QB of the anti-ghost field is uh, the B field, which was eliminated by using its equations of motion, which is D mu A mu. So 
and uh, I have now to clean the blackboard, but what we can now derive from this, in principle we could stop here, but we can now make it even more explicit and derive commutation relations with the creation operators. And this gives us the information of the BRS transformations of the states. If we know how the BRS transformation of all these creation operators is, you can infer what is the BRS transformation of those states. In other words, you know what happens if you act with this QB on all the one particle states. And then you can do the discussion from last week, uh, which one particle state is physical, which one is unphysical, what are equivalence classes between one particle states and so on. And that is what I want to end with in this section. And so you can already think a little bit uh, what happens if you plug in the expressions of the field operators in terms of the creation and annihilation operators. Okay, yeah, question. Yes, indeed. The color index is everywhere suppressed here in the entire lecture so far, except for in the first line where I concluded that we just have copies of uh, Lagrangians without color index. So, we can now infer some commutational relations with creation or annihilation operators. So, for example, uh, the field, uh, vector field, A mu, contains four different um, creation operators for the four different lambdas. Two of the lambdas correspond to transverse polarizations. Two other lambdas are uh, unphysical. So, if you look at this relationship here, on the left-hand side we have the full vector field with four different polarizations. On the right hand side, we have something which is a total derivative. What happens if you go to momentum space? If you go to momentum space, then the right hand side is proportional to the four vector k mu. So on the left hand side, we have something which has, is a linear combination of the four epsilons. One of the epsilons is proportional to k mu. All the other ones are linearly independent. Therefore, if you match up the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side, then it means the creation operator for the epsilon, which is proportional to the momentum, that goes into the right-hand side. And the BRS transformation of all the other epsilons, which are not proportional to the momentum, they must vanish. So therefore, we obtain QB with A, or A dagger, of lambda equal 1 and 2, they are not proportional to the momentum, so the QB of them must vanish. Then, let's write down something that does not vanish. If you start with a dagger of lambda equal L, lambda equal L. If you have lambda equal L, then this corresponds to the term here in the vector field where the epsilon is proportional to k mu. So then you do the commutator of QB with this A dagger. The prefactor is k mu. So on the right hand side, you then get also k mu times the creation operator of the ghost. So the commutator of QB with A dagger of lambda equal A gives you a dagger of the ghost field. And let's directly write down here something else. Namely, what happens if you do the commutation relation with the anti-ghost generator? Anti-ghost, QB with the anti-ghost gives you d mu a mu. But what is d mu a mu? In d mu a mu, uh, in the momentum space, you get a contraction of k mu times all the epsilons k mu times all the epsilons give zero, except for in the case where we have the scalar polarization. So the scalar polarization is the one which survives if you contract with the momentum. 
So then we can write it like this. So you read this as follows. QB commutator with uh, A dagger of L gives A dagger of C. QB with A dagger of C bar gives A dagger of S. These are the non-vanishing commutation relations. So and this can now be used to obtain information on the one particle states. So that is maybe the more powerful information because you can use that uh, relationship for multi-particle states as well, which are composed by applying many, many creation operators onto the vacuum. So now from here you know for every state in our Fox space with arbitrary combinations of physical and unphysical states, you know what is the BRS transformation of that state. But let's visualize it in a simple way by looking at the one particle states. And uh, this would be a one particle representatives of our physical Hilbert space, which is the quotient space of the kernel of QB divided by the image of QB. As I said, let's only look at one particle states. So, QB of the vector field states with transverse polarizations lambda equal 1 and 2. This is obtained by applying a dagger of 1 and 2 onto the vacuum. This commutes with QB, so we get here 0. So these states are BRST invariant, and uh, according to the notion of the last week, they would lie in this space V physical. So they are representatives of physical equivalence classes. On the other hand, let us write down in a nice structure a so-called BRST quartet, because the unphysical states Everything else is unphysical, can be organized in terms of so-called BRST quartets, which makes the structure really transparent and nice. So I order it now in a nice geometric arrangement. Let us start with lambda equal L. Lambda equal L, what happens if I apply QB onto that state? If I apply QB onto that state, I can look it up here. Here I get a commutator of QB with A dagger of L, I get A dagger of C. So if I apply QB onto that state, I get a ghost state. On the other hand, let us start here with an anti-ghost state. What happens if I apply QB onto an anti-ghost state? I can look here, I get the scalar polarization of the vector field. So I get a state with lambda equal s. And then you see an arrangement of four different one particle states, which are related to each other by BRST transformations. And all of them are unphysical. Why? This state here is not BRST invariant, therefore it is not an element of our physical subspace and therefore immediately unphysical. This state is the BRST transformation of something else, and therefore it is on BRST invariant because of the nil potency, but that doesn't help. It is equivalent to the zero vector, so it lies in the equivalence class of zero, therefore it is unphysical for that reason. Similarly here, this is not physical because it's uh, not BRST invariant, this is the BRST variation of something else, and therefore it's equivalent to the zero vector and therefore unphysical. And so you see that uh, it falls into this uh, pattern of four states. Um, uh, these two states belong to the vector field, and they have ghost number zero. Then the BRST transformation always increases ghost number by one. So here from this we get a state which is non-vanishing but has ghost number plus one. Here we need to start with a state with ghost number minus one. And because of um, some 
symmetry of the setup of the theory for every ghost state. There is also an anti-ghost state in the theory. Therefore, once we are here, there exists also this state, which must have such a BRS transformation. And therefore, we get such a BRST quartet. So this is a BRST quartet. It contains four unphysical states. And all in all, we can now see the summary of this chapter of the lecture. We have six different types of one particle states. Two of them are physical. They are BRST invariant and cannot be written as the BRST transformation of anything else. And we have four unphysical states which are arranged as a BRST quartet. So they are unphysical and therefore either they are not in the kernel of Q, so they are not BRST invariant, or they are in the image of Q and therefore equivalent to the zero vector. So this means they are not element in this physical subspace and that means they are equivalent to uh, the zero vector. So this picture is an important picture which summarizes the nature and the structure of the BRST setup. And it uh, realizes this idea which we started from that was discussed last week, uh, which we wanted to achieve. Namely, we wanted to achieve exactly such a structure on our space of states where we can separate in a beautiful way physical from unphysical degrees of freedom. And now you can check explicitly by just looking at the states that those states indeed have positive norm, whereas those states are unphysical, but uh, that implies that the physical states have positive norm, and uh, this means that this space here defined by the equivalence classes is actually a Hilbert space in the true mathematical meaning of the word. So that is nice, that is a good result. We have realized our BRST formalism and constructed our physical Hilbert space of states, at least in the free theory. And let me remark the same construction uh, does not only apply in the free theory, but also applies to asymptotically free states. in the LSC scattering theory. So we didn't discuss that uh, general theory in quantum field theory last semester, but this was discussed at length in this quantum field theory 1A lecture, where you can uh, look at the full theory with interactions. But even in the full theory with interactions, there is, of course, the possibility to have scattering processes where particles, the true one particle states of the interacting theory, uh, go very far away from each other. So they behave asymptotically like free particles. And those uh, free particles then can be described also by a Fox space. And that Fox space for those asymptotically free particles has exactly the structure that we discussed here, it's identical. Also on that Fox space, you are then able to define such a QB operator with the identical properties. And then you see that uh, also on the level of the full theory with interactions, you can define exactly uh, this structure. Okay, uh, that ends our section. Let us continue with something else. What is the time? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions, first of all? Yep. Maybe just one towards um, the picture of the ghost. Um, because you said that for every ghost state, there exists an anti-ghost state. And also, we had this kind of awkward commutation relation between the um, creation operators of the ghost and the anti-ghost. Mm -hmm. And also, there was this notion that we cannot interpret anti-ghost and ghost as anti-particles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there some interpretation for the ghosts, or are they just necessary for this formalism? 
they are necessary for the formalism and uh, there will be maybe an additional interpretation uh, in the next chapter when we discuss unitarity. So in a way you can see that ghosts must appear in Feynman diagrams with interactions in order to correct the imaginary part of the S matrix elements with the ghosts in the Feynman diagrams the imaginary part becomes correct without the ghosts the imaginary part becomes wrong and the S matrix is not unitary as a result. So that is another role of the ghost fields but on the level of states the ghost fields have this role of establishing this quartet mechanism and the BRST structure of states and so um, I would say the interpretation doesn't need uh, a relationship like uh, this is the antiparticle to the ghost uh, and particle antiparticle for ghost doesn't make sense since they are not particles they are not uh, to be interpreted as particles the states of course have similar properties as uh, ordinary one particle states but they are unphysical by definition and uh, they violate for example the spin statistics theorem so that would be a spin zero particle however a fermion and uh, this combination violates the spin statistics theorem of quantum field theory uh, which shows that the particle is not physical and so it's, it's not really right to think of them as particles um, only in this formal sense of, of uh, Fox space states as long as you have these unphysical degrees of freedom in your theory. In many references, in particular in the maybe more distant past, uh, it was often claimed that ghosts and anti-ghosts behave like particles, antiparticles to each other, or the anti-ghost field is the Hermitian conjugate of the ghost fields and so on. Uh, but this has been abandoned and therefore it is now sometimes stressed that they are not. But and, uh, obviously you see from the derivation we don't need that they are the Hermitian conjugates of one another. In contrast, the whole formalism works beautifully. If we say the ghost field is Hermitian, the anti-ghost field is anti-Hermitian, uh, but they are not related to each other, except for by the commutation relations that we wrote down. Other questions? Okay, let us briefly discuss um, a repetition of what we already discussed in the context of electrodynamics in the last semester, namely uh, these favorite so-called problems and magical solutions. Which are kind of simpler problems and simple solutions Whereas afterwards we want to discuss the unitarity of the S matrix, which is a little bit um, more involved. So see also quantum field theory 1b. So uh, abelian QED, abelian theory and Compton scattering. Let's write down the Feynman diagrams for Compton scattering in QED. There are two Feynman diagrams for electron photon scattering, where the photons couple in this way or in the reversed way. And we want to write down the T matrix element or the S matrix element or anyway the scattering amplitude for this process which has a structure like this, TFI is equal to polarization vectors, epsilon mu um, for the first photon um, and epsilon nu complex conjugated for the second photon times some remaining amplitude, m mu nu, coming from the computation of the Feynman diagrams. Let's not write down what this m mu nu is, but it is some expression which involves b norms, u bar and u and p slash uh, um, quantities and so on. Here for the physical Compton scattering process, we want physical photons, so the epsilons are physical 
transverse polarization vectors. And now comes the problem. The question is, is this uh, scattering amplitude Lorentz invariant or not? And this is a good question which doesn't have an obvious answer because the physical transverse polarization vectors, they do not behave like ordinary four vectors. They do not transform with lambda mu nu Lorentz transformations, but they have a more different, uh, more complicated Lorentz transformation property. And therefore the question is whether the whole ex expression um, is the same calculated in every reference frame. So they are not Lorentz covariant. So the question is, is the whole expression Lorentz covariant? And what is the answer? We did it in QED last semester. The answer is, of course, yes, the whole expression is Lorentz invariant. And why is that? Because the difference from a Lorentz covariant expression is proportional to the momenta k mu, k1 or k2. The deviation from the correct behavior is proportional to k mu. And the amplitude m mu nu satisfies a word identity such that its contraction with the case uh, gives zero. And that is why the non-Lorentz covariant terms drop out. And the full result is Lorentz invariant. So that is the problem and the magical solution. Namely, there just happens to be a word identity, which we have proven, which is k1 mu times m mu nu is zero. And that is also k2 nu times m mu nu. So whenever you replace an epsilon by the corresponding momentum, you get zero. And because of that, the non-Lorentz covariant terms drop out and the TFI is Lorentz invariant. That is nice problem and a magical solution. And the technical ingredient in this magical solution is a word identity. Word identity stands for this relationship, which one can prove by explicit observation. Now, next question. What happens in the non-abelian case? Let's do QCD compton scattering. QCD Compton scattering. You have, of course, the same Feynman rules as in QED, but there are additional Feynman rules. Does anybody know an additional Feynman diagram which contributes to the process quark uh, gluon scattering in QCD? Here the quark is a mediator. Uh, no, uh, sorry, a gluon. A gluon is a mediator. How could the diagram then look like? Just replace the quark with the gluon. Okay, but if we have here a gluon, then you have a vertex quark, gluon, gluon. Ah, okay. That vertex doesn't exist. The spin or line must always be conserved. Spin one half must be conserved somehow. So there is not a vertex one quark and two gluons, but uh, there are some other QCD vertices. Yeah? There could just be additional gluons coming out of existing gluons? Additional gluons, but then it would be a different process. So we want to look at this process with exactly this uh, initial and this final state. So the final and initial state should not be changed, but uh, I claim that there is a third Feynman diagram, which is specific to non-abelian gauge theories with the same initial and final states. Yep. So kind of like a T, so the, so the initial fermion with the end fermion, and then gluon, gluon, gluon. Yes, that's it, so like this. 
Then you have here a triple gluon vertex and here uh, a normal vertex quark quark gluon, right? And then you might say this is maybe S channel, that is U channel and this is T channel or something like this, indeed. So that is the third diagram. And uh, you did it with Matthias last week. This vertex here has a horrendously complicated Feynman rule with six terms involving all the three momenta of the attached gluons. And now the question repeats itself. Is the matrix element for this Lorentz invariant? So the matrix element would look again like that. You would have epsilons for the transverse polarizations which are not Lorentz covariant. They will be multiplied with some m u nu, but for the m u nu there is a third Feynman diagram which contributes. And the question is, is the whole result Lorentz invariant? And so you could ask, does the m u nu still satisfy this word identity? If yes, then of course the result is again Lorentz invariant. So what do you think? Any guesses? Okay, so this will be an exercise. So you can then check what happens for yourself. And the situation is quite a bit more complicated. Okay, next thing, QED or QCD, that is now the same, um, scattering for fermions. So let's do this, just this process, fermion antifermion goes into fermion antifermion. There is just a single Feynman diagram regardless whether you have QED or QCD. And uh, the structure is the following. So I times TFI, if you really write down the Feynman rules, then uh, you have here a gluon or a photon propagator and the value of the gluon or photon propagator is the following, minus I over Q squared times the numerator, and in general the numerator is gauge dependent. So then we have here g mu nu minus q mu q nu divided by q square plus q mu q nu divided by q square times xi times something else. And let's say here the something else is just dot 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 with overall a Lorentz index mu. So let's call this thing J mu as an abbreviation like a current. So anyway, something which is contracted with this uh, Lorentz index coming from the um, gluon or photon propagator and this uh, could be the expression corresponding to that fermion line or to the other fermion line. So and it goes on. Okay, so here the gluon propagator depends on the gauge fixing. Question, does the physical result for this scattering amplitude also depend on the gauge fixing or does the gauge fixing somehow drop out of the calculation? If it were depending on the gauge fixing parameter, that would be odd because we do not know how to measure the gauge fixing parameter, so it shouldn't be a physical parameter of the theory. It is only an artifact that we introduced in order to temporarily define a quantum theory, but it shouldn't be a physical parameter. So question, does it drop out? So the problem is, or the question, is the physical scattering amplitude depending on Xi? And the answer is, we did it also in quantum field theory one. So the xi dependent terms are longitudinal. They are proportional to the gluon or photon momentum. 
So all the site dependence uh, happens in a way that you obtain something proportional to a contraction of the gluon momentum times the current J mu which couples to the gluon. So you get this contraction of the gluon momentum times th such an expression corresponding to such a fermion line, for example, J mu. And we looked at this in QED, and the QCD calculation is identical. Uh, this result is simply uh, zero here. So in, uh, it would be something like that, Q mu contracted with a spin or u bar of p prime times a gamma matrix gamma mu times u of p. And q is exactly the difference between p prime and p. And uh, then you can do a simplification uh, such that you get a difference of two terms which are equal. m minus m gives zero. So because of that, uh, TFI is actually xi independent. So and this is again something like a word identity, namely such a building block of a Feynman diagram satisfies a relationship. If you contract with a gluon momentum, you get zero. Similarly here, this is a word identity where some expression contracted with a photon momentum gives zero. These are identities coming from gauge invariance of the classical theory. So here the gauge fixing parameter drops out. And then we have a physical interpretation of the S matrix element. All right, so these are simple problems and simple solutions. Obviously, uh, the solutions are and the problems are formulated here at three level, at the level of very simple, lowest order Feynman diagrams. But they give you an illustration of what problems in principle exist and how you can solve them in principle. So uh, you could generalize this and ask yourself for any S matrix element that you calculate at arbitrarily high loop orders, uh, are scattering matrices uh, Lorentz invariant? And then you would need to prove such properties at all orders. And similarly, are physical S matrix elements independent of the gauge fixing parameter? And again, you would need to prove such relationships at all orders. So uh, for this interpretation of the full theory, then the, uh, establishing such identities at all loop orders is a crucial thing. But uh, the ingredients and the outcomes that you would like to have are very well illustrated by these simple examples. And so you can imagine now, uh, first of all, that it can work how it can work and what are in general the ingredients. But it's already important enough to know that it works at three level, which is of course very important. But now let us come to the real thing of today's lecture, namely the unitarity of the physical S matrix, which also explains a bit more the role of the ghost fields. And I think um, I organized it such that this morning we will just do an overview of what the question is and some general interesting relationships. And in the afternoon, we will finish the topic. And then also do something else with, because it will not take extremely long. So uh, uh, we start with the S operator. So the operator corresponding to the S matrix. And the S operator can be written as an operator is equal to the unit operator plus I times a T operator. And then this TFI would be a matrix elements of that T operator. And it is nice to split it in this way because there is, of course, the possibility for no <coughs> scattering at all, which would be described by the identity, and therefore T is the really interesting physical effect from scattering. Then the S operator should be a unitary, and unitarity, unitarity uh, means the equation S dagger S equal the unit operator. And that is, of course, now equivalent to some relationship for the T operator. 
namely S dagger S is now T dagger T plus some linear terms um, in T plus the unit operator that should be equal to the unit operator. So you can uh, solve it. You can cancel the unit operator from the equation and then on the right hand side you have just minus I times T minus T dagger. So that is the unitarity relation equivalent to this expressed for the T operator. Okay. So, and uh, this relationship is more useful for us because it expresses the unitarity in terms of the really interesting part of the scattering um, amplitude. Now, generally speaking, I already mentioned the word imaginary parts. Imaginary parts are very important for unitarity discussions, uh, and you can think of this already in terms of complex numbers. Complex numbers which are unitary are simply numbers e to the i alpha, okay, with modulus square equal to one. So that is a unitary number. A unitary number which is not identical to one or minus one must have an imaginary part, right? So this is cosine alpha plus i times sine alpha. So if this unitary number is not equal to plus minus one, it must have an imaginary part which is non-zero. And how large is the imaginary part depends obviously uh, on the real part. There is a relationship between the real and imaginary part. I'm saying something trivial here. But the same is true for a unitary operator. If you have a unitary operator, its imaginary part cannot be anything. It must be related to the real part. Uh, and uh, that is exactly the relationship. So here, for example, the counterpart to this T would be, let's say, uh, 1 minus cosine alpha. If you know 1 minus cosine alpha, you can predict sine alpha. That is exactly the same thing here. So if you uh, know T dagger T, you can predict something about the imaginary part of T. That is the essence of this. And uh, so this is the general unitarity relation. And there is a corollary of this, which is the optical theorem. And very often, it is sufficient to just look at the optical theorem, which basically corresponds to that general equation by taking a matrix element, namely a diagonal I, I matrix element of the same equation. If you take the matrix element of two states, I, I, I stands for initial state, let's say in a scattering, take the matrix element of this operator equation with two equal states, I and I, like an operator or scalar product from the left and right, with some equal states. Um, let me maybe draw it on the blackboard such that you see what I mean. So I do this here, I, I, matrix element, and also here, I, I matrix element. But what do I get then in more explicit form? I get the following. I get a sum over F of the matrix element TFI absolute value square, because the matrix element can now be written in matrix form by summing over intermediate states F. I sum over a full basis of my Hilbert space of states, sum over F. And then I get matrix element TFI times TIF star, which is the absolute value square of that matrix element. OK, so that is the left hand side. Simply get a sum of squares of scattering matrix elements. And on the right hand side here, by taking this matrix element, I get the matrix element TII minus T star II. T minus T star is the imaginary part of T. And that minus i drops out. I simply get here two times the imaginary part of TII. So I get a relationship between the imaginary part of a complex scattering amplitude and squares of complex scattering amplitudes. So an interesting quantum mechanical relationship. Because, as you know, quantum mechanics talks always about probability amplitudes, and the probabilities are squares of probability amplitudes. And here you have a relationship between squares of probability amplitudes, in other words, real measurable probabilities, 
and imaginary parts of probability amplitudes. So it is an unusual relationship coming from unitarity. We can visualize it a little bit with pseudo diagrams. So the left hand side corresponds to this sort of thing. You have here an initial state i and then arbitrary final states f uh, symbolized like this, some initial state which is fixed and then an arbitrary set of final states. This gives an amplitude and you take the absolute square of all these amplitudes and on the right hand side you have uh, an initial state, then some arbitrary non-trivial interactions and at the end you again have the same initial state as you started with and you take the amplitude. So you have a relationship between squares of such Feynman diagrams where E goes to anything and Feynman diagrams where I goes to I with anything in between. That is the optical theorem. And so here you see something which is proportional to a total probability. the total probability of I going into any arbitrary final state F. That is exactly what you would call a total probability of I scattering in, into anything. Whereas this is a scattering amplitude, the imaginary part thereof. And it is a special scattering amplitude, namely the forward scattering amplitude where nothing happens. So this is what the optical theorem tells us. And it is a corollary of the unitarity of the S matrix. Now some remarks about uh, unitarity and this optical theorem. First of all, uh, the unitarity of the S operator holds by construction. In particular, in the operator formalism, it is kind of obvious because the S operator is given by the exponential e to the i times integral over the Lagrangian density. And uh, the Lagrangian density is Hermitian. At least we consider only theories with Hermitian Lagrangian. And then the S operator defined by the exponential is automatically unitary. So this unitarity relationship is true. It is guaranteed to be valid in the theory, but it applies to the full S matrix, including unphysical states. So the Lagrangian contains the unphysical fields. It is Hermitian if we include everything that it depends on and uh, if we quantize, we quantize in the way we just discussed. We have a space of states which has negative and indefinite norm states but on that space the S operator is guaranteed to satisfy this relationship. So and let me also write down the physical remark. So the optical theorem generates relationship between the square of lower order diagrams right, uh, and imaginary parts of higher orders. So at least if you think in terms of perturbation theory, then uh, this equation must be valid order by order in perturbation theory. So if you have here Feynman diagrams with uh, let's say two powers of the coupling, you square them, you get fourth powers of the coupling. So you get a prediction from calculating Feynman diagrams with two powers of the coupling. You square them, then you know what is the imaginary part of Feynman diagrams with four powers of the coupling. So you get relationships of lower orders squared and the imaginary part of higher orders. That implies, for example, you calculate at tree level. You calculate something at tree level. 
you square the three level Feynman diagrams, you get a fixed answer. Then you can predict what must be the imaginary part of loop diagrams. And uh, the optical theorem then tells you what must be the imaginary part of loop diagrams and if you happen to calculate loop diagrams in some form or some way and the imaginary part comes out differently, then you have destroyed the unitarity of the S operator. That is the meaning of this relationship. Now the question is, what happens if you restrict your S operator onto the physical space, onto our equivalence classes on this H physical space of uh, positive norm states, is it still unitary just on the physical subspace? Is S restricted on H physical still unitary. And uh, that is equivalent to saying the following. If you have here the sum over all possible final states, can you, instead of summing over all possible final states in the full space, can you just sum over all the physical final states? Does that already give the same result uh, as the summation over all final states? So that would mean the total probability of physical final states is equal to 1 for any scattering. That is really the question. So you start with some physical state, you scatter and uh, you get some distribution of final states and uh, does the sum of all physical final states add up to one. That is the question and the answer is not obvious. The answer is only obvious if we sum over all states including the unphysical ones and that is our discussion for this afternoon. We will answer this question. Of course the answer is yes. And uh, the reason is again um, word identities and generalized word identities so-called Slavnov-Taylor identities, which uh, lead to similar relationships as the ones that we see here on the upper blackboard. And because of those relationships, you will see that in the summation, all the unphysical stuff cancels among itself, such that uh, the equation here is already correct if you sum just over the physical final states instead of overall final states. And so what we need to do is to establish exactly this cancellation between the unphysical states among themselves. And we do it again, like here, for the simplest case for a three-level Feynman diagram, which is already non-trivial, um, but we will do it and this will again illustrate for you what would be the general question and some idea on methods how you would tackle the general case at higher orders. Okay, so see you in the afternoon. <laughs>